Chapter Seventeen of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christianos ad leones. By the time that they had got round again to the unlucky bakers, the mob had been swollen to a size which even the area of the forum would not contain, and it filled the adjacent streets and by the same time it had come home to its leaders and indeed to every one who used his reason at all that it was very far from certain that there were any christians in sicca and if so still very far from easy to say where they were and the difficulty was of so practical a character as to keep them inactive for the space of several hours meanwhile their passions were excited to the boiling point by the very presence of the difficulty as men go mad of thirst when water is denied them at length after a long season of such violent commotion such restless pain such curses shrieks and blasphemies such bootless gesticulations such aimless contests with each other that they seemed to be already inmates of the prison beneath they set off in a blind way to make the circuit of the city as before they had paraded round the forum still in the night errand line looking out for what might turn up where they were sure of nothing and relieving the intense irritation of their passions by locomotion if nothing more substantial was offered to them it was an awful day for the respectable inhabitants of the place worse than anything that even the most timid of them had anticipated when they had showed their jealousy of a popular movement against the proscribed religion for the stimulus of famine and pestilence was added to hatred of christianity in that unreasoning multitude the magistrates shut themselves up in dismay the small body of roman soldiery reserved their strength for the defence of themselves and the poor wretches not a few who had fallen from the faith and offered sacrifice hung out from their doors sinful heathen symbols to avert a storm against which apostasy was no sufficient safeguard in this conduct the gnostics and other sectaries imitated them while the tertullianists took a more manly part from principle or pride it would require the brazen voice which homer speaks of or the magic pen of sir walter to catalogue and to picture as far as it is lawful to do either the figures and groups of that most miserable procession as it went forward it gained a variety and strength which the circuit of the forum could not furnish the more respectable religious establishments shut their gates and would have nothing to do with it the priests of jupiter the educational establishments of the temple of mercury the temple of the genius of rome near the capital the hierophants of isis the minerva the juno the esculapius viewed the popular rising with terror and disgust but these were not the popular worships the vast homestead of astarte which in the number and vowed profligacy of its inhabitants rivalled the vaults upon the forum the old rites many and diversified if separately obscure which came from punic times the new importations from syria and phrygia and a number of other haunts and schools of depravity and crime did their part in swelling or giving character to the concourse the hungry and idle rabble the filthy beggars who fed on the offal of the sacrifices the drivers and slaughterers of the beasts sacrificed the tumblers and mountebanks who amused the gaping market people dancers singers pipers from low taverns and drinking-houses infamous creatures young and old men and boys half naked and not half sober brutal blacks the aboriginal race of the atlas with their appetites written on their skulls and features canaanites as they call themselves from the coast the wild beast keepers from the amphitheatre troops of labourers from the fields to whom the epidemic was a time of saturnalia and the degraded company alas how numerous and how pitiable who took their nightly stand in long succession at the doors of their several cells in the deep galleries under the thermae all these and many others had their part and place in the procession 
there you might see the devilish emblems of idolatry borne aloft by wretches from the great punic temple while frantic forms ragged and famished wasted and shameless leaped and pranced around them there too was a choir of bacchanals ready at a moment with songs as noisy as they were unutterable and there was the priest of the punic saturn the child devourer a sort of moloch to whom the martyrdom of christians was a sacred rite he and all his attendants in fiery colored garments as became a sanguinary religion and there moreover was a band of fanatics devotees of sibylle or of the syrian goddess if indeed the two rites were distinct they were bedizened with ribbons and rags of various colors and smeared over with paint they had long hair like women and turbans on their heads they pushed their way to the head of the procession being quite worthy of the post of honor and seizing the baker's ass put their goddess on the back of it some of them were playing the fife others clashing cymbals others danced others yelled others rolled their heads and others flogged themselves such was the character of the frenzied host which progressed slowly through the streets while every now and then when there was an interval in the hubbub the words christianos ad leones were thundered out by some ruffian voice and a thousand others fiercely responded still no christian was forthcoming and it was plain that the rage of the multitude must be discharged in other quarters if the difficulty continued in satisfying it at length some one recollected the site of the christian chapel when it existed thither went the multitude and effected an entrance without delay it had long been turned to other purposes and was now a store of casks and leather bottles the miserable sacristan had long given up any practical observance of his faith and remained on the spot a keeper of the premises for the trader who owned them they found him and dragged him into the street and brought him forward to the ass and to the idol on its back and bade him worship the one and the other the poor wretch obeyed he worshipped the ass he worshipped the idol and he worshipped the genius of the emperor but his persecutors wanted blood they would not submit to be cheated of their draft so when they had made him do whatever they exacted they flung him under the feet of the multitude who as they passed on soon trod all life and breath out of him and sent him to the powers below to whom he had just before been making his profession their next adventure was with a tertullianist who stationed himself at his shop door displayed the sign of the cross and walking leisurely forward seized the idol on the ass's back broke it over his knee and flung the portions into the crowd for a few minutes they stared on him with astonishment then some women fell upon him with their nails and teeth and tore the poor fanatic till he fell bleeding and lifeless upon the ground in the higher and better part of the city which they now approached lived the widow of a duumvir who in his day had made a bold profession of christianity the well-connected lady was a christian also and was sheltered by her great friends from the persecution she was bringing up a family in great privacy and with straitened means and with as much religious strictness as was possible under the circumstances of the place she kept them from all bad sights and bad company was careful as to the character of the slaves she placed about them and taught them all she knew of her religion which was quite sufficient for their salvation they had all been baptized some by herself in default of the proper minister and as far as they could show at their tender ages which lay between thirteen and seven the three girls and the two boys were advancing in the love of truth and sanctity her husband some years back when presiding in the forum had punished with just severity an act of ungrateful fraud and the perpetrator had always cherished a malignant hatred of him and his the moment of gratifying it had now arrived and he pointed out to the infuriated rabble the secluded mansion where the christian household dwelt he could not offer to them a more acceptable service 
and the lady's modest apartment was soon swarming with enemies of her god and his followers in spite of her heart-rending cries and supplications her children were seized and when the youngest boy clung to her the mother was thrown senseless upon the pavement the whole five were carried off in triumph it was the greatest success of the day there was some hesitation how to dispose of them at last the girls were handed over to the priestesses of astarte and the boys to the loathsome votaries of Sibylle. revenge upon christians was the motive principle of the riot but the prospect of plunder stimulated numbers and here christians could not minister to their desires they began the day by the attack upon the provision shop and now they had reached the aristocratic quarter of the city and they gazed with envy and cupidity at the noble mansions which occupied it they began to shout out bread bread while they uttered threats against the christians they violently beat at the closed gates and looked about for means of scaling the high walls which defended them in front the cravings of famished men soon took form and organization they began to ask relief from house to house nothing came amiss and loaves figs grapes wine found their way into the hands and mouths of those who were the least exhausted and the least enfeebled a second line of fierce supplicants succeeded to the first and it was plain that unless some diversion were effected the respectable quarter of sicca had found a worse enemy than the locust the houses of the government susceptor or tax collector of the tabularius or registrar of the defensor or city council and one or two others had already been the scene of collisions between the domestic slaves and the multitude when a demand was made upon the household of another of the curia who held the office of flamen dialis he was a wealthy easy-going man generally popular with no appetite for persecution at all but still no desire to be persecuted he had more than tolerated the christians and had at this time a christian among his slaves this was a greek a splendid cook and perfumer and he would not have lost him for a large sum of money however life and limb were nearer to him even than his dinner and a jonah must be cast overboard to save the ship in trepidation yet with greater satisfaction his fellow domestics thrust the poor helpless man out of the house and secured the door behind him he was a man of middle age of a grave aspect and he looked silently and calmly upon the infuriated and yelling multitude who were swarming up the hill about him and swelling the number of his persecutors what had been his prospects had he remained in his earthly master's service his fill of meat and drink while he was strong and skilful the stocks or scourge if he ever failed to please him and the old age and death of the worn-out hack who has once caracoled in the procession or snorted at the coming fight what are his prospects now a moment's agony a martyr's death and the everlasting beatific vision of him for whom he died the multitude cry out to the ass or to the lion worship the ass or fight the lion he was dragged to the ass's head and commanded to kneel down before the irrational beast in the course of a minute he had lifted up his eyes to heaven had signed himself with the cross had confessed his saviour and had been torn to pieces by the multitude they anticipated the lion of the amphitheatre a lull followed sure to be succeeded by a fresh storm not every household had a christian cook to make a victim of plunder riot and outrage were becoming the order of the day successive messengers were sent up in breathless haste to the capital and the camp for aid but the romans returned for answer that they had enough to do in defending the government buildings and offices they suggested measures however for putting the mob on a false scent or involving them in some difficult or tedious enterprise 
which would give the authorities time for deliberation and for taking the rioters at disadvantage if the magistrates could get them out of the city it would be a great point they could then shut the gates upon them and deal with them as they would in that case too the insurgents would straggle and divide and then they might be disposed of in detail they were showing symptoms of returning fury when a voice suddenly cried out agellius the christian agellius the sorcerer agellius to the lions to the farm of varius to the cottage of agellius to the southwest gate a sudden yell burst forth from the vast multitude when the voice ceased the impulse had been given as at the first the tide of human beings ebbed and retreated and licking the base of the hill rushed vehemently on one side and roared like a torrent towards the southwest juba thy prophecy is soon to be fulfilled the locusts will bring more harm on thy brother's home than imperial edict or local magistrate the decline of day will hardly prevent the visitation End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain agellius flits a change had passed over the fair face of nature as seen from the cottage of agellius since that evening on which our story opened and it is so painful to contemplate waste decay and disappointment that we mean to say little about it there was the same cloudless sky as then and the sun travelled in its silent and certain course with even a more intense desire than then to ripen grain and fruit for the use of man but its occupation was gone for fruit and grain were not nor man to collect and to enjoy them a dark broad shadow passed across the beautiful prospect and disfigured it when you looked more closely it was as if a fire had burned up the whole surface included under that shadow and had stripped the earth of its clothing nothing had escaped not a head of canna not a rose or carnation not an orange or an orange blossom not a bacconi not a cluster of unripe grapes not a berry of the olive not a blade of grass gardens meadows vineyards orchards copses instead of rejoicing in the rich variety of hue which lately was their characteristic were now reduced to one dreary cinder colour the smoke of fires was actually rising from many points where the spoilt and poisonous vegetation was burning in heaps or the countless corpses of the invading foe or of the cattle or of the human beings whom the pestilence had carried off the most furious inroad of savage hordes of vandals or of saracens who were destined at successive eras to come and waste that country could not have spread such thorough desolation the slaves of the farm of varius were sorrowfully turning to a new employment that of clearing away the wreck and disappointment of the bright spring from flower-bed vineyard and field it was on the forenoon of the eventful day whose course we have been tracing in the preceding chapters that a sharp-looking boy presented himself to agellius who was directing his labourers in their work i am come from jucundus he said he has instant need of you you are to go with me and by my way and this is the proof i tell you truth he sends you this note and wishes you in a bad time the best gifts of bacchus and ceres agellius took the tablets and went with them across the road to the place where cacilius was at work in appearance a slave the letter ran thus jucundus to agellius i trust you are well enough to move you are not safe for many days in your cottage there is a rising this morning against the christians and you may be visited unless you are ambitious of sticks and tartarus follow the boy without questioning agellius showed the letter to the priest we are no longer safe here my father he said whither shall we go let us go together can you take me to carthage carthage is quite as dangerous answered cacilius and sicca is more central 
we can but leap into the sea at carthage here there are many lines to retreat upon i am known there i am not known here here too i hear all that goes on through the proconsulate and numidia but what can we do asked agellius here we cannot remain and you at least cannot venture into the city some whither we must go and where is that the priest thought we must separate he said the tears came into agellius eyes though i am a stranger continued cacilius i know more of the neighbourhood of sicca than you who are a native there is a famous christian retreat on the north of the city and by this time i doubt not or rather i know it is full of refugees the fury of the enemy is extending on all hands and our brethren from as far as kirtha round to Kerubus, are falling back upon it the only difficulty is how to get round to it without going through sicca let us go together said agellius cacilius showed signs of perplexity and his mind retired into itself he seemed for the moment to be simply absent from the scene about him but soon his intelligence returned no he said we must separate for the time it will not be for long that is i suppose your uncle will take good care of you and he has influence we are safest just now when most independent of each other it is only for a while we shall meet again soon i tell you so did we keep together just now it would be the worse for each of us you go with the boy i will go off to the place i mentioned oh my father said the youth how will you get there what shall i suffer from my fears about you fear not answered cacilius mind i tell you so it will be a trying time but my hour is not yet come i am good for years yet so are you for many more than mine he will protect and rescue me though i know not how go leave me to myself agellius o oh, my father my only stay upon earth whom god sent me in my extreme need to whom i owe myself must i then quit you must a layman desert a priest the young the old ah it is i really not you who am without protection angels surround you father but i am a poor wanderer give me your blessing that evil may not touch me i go do not kneel said the priest they will see you stop i have got to tell you how and where to find me he then proceeded to give him the necessary instructions walk out he said along the road to tiber succumber to the third milestone you will come to a country road pursue it walk a thousand steps then again for the space of seven paternosters and then speak to the man upon your right hand and now away with you god speed you we shall not long be parted and he made the sign of the cross over him that old chap gives himself airs said the boy when agellius joined him what may he be one of your slaves agellius you are a pert boy answered he for asking me the question they say the christians brought the locusts said firmian by their enchantments and there's a jolly row beginning in the forum just now the report goes that you are a christian that's because your people have nothing better to do than talk against their neighbours because you are so soft rather said the boy another man would have knocked me down for saying it but you are lackadaisical folk who bear insults tamely arnobia says your father was a christian father and son are not always the same religion nowadays said agellius ay ay answered firmian but the christians came from egypt and as cook there is the son of cook and soldier is son of soldier so christian take my word for it is the son of a christian christians boast i believe answered agellius that they are of no one race or country but are members of a large unpatriotic family whose home is in the sky christians answered the boy would never have framed the great roman empire that was the work of heroes great caesar marius marcus brutus camillus cicero scylla lucullus scipio could never have been christians arnobius says they are a skulking set of fellows 
i suppose you wish to be a hero said agellius i am to be a pleader answered firmian i should like to be a great orator like cicero and every one listening to me they were walking along the top of a mud wall which separated varius's farm from his neighbours when suddenly firmian who led the way leaped down into a copse which reached as far as the ravine in which the knoll terminated towards sicca the boy still went forward by devious paths till they had mounted as high as the city wall you are bringing me where there is no entrance said agellius the boy laughed <laughs> jucundus told me to bring you by a blind way he said you know best why this is one of our ways in and out there was an aperture in the wall and the bricks and stones about it were loose and admitted of removal it was such a private way of passage as schoolboys know of on getting through agellius found himself in a neglected garden or a small close everything was silent about them as if the inhabitants were away there was a great noise in the distance as if something unusual were going on in the heart of the town the boy told him to follow him as fast as he could without exciting remark and leading him by lanes and alleys unknown to agellius at last brought him close upon the scene of riot this time the expedition in search of christians had just commenced to cross the forum was to shorten his journey and perhaps was safer than to risk meeting the mob in the streets firmian took the step and while their attention was directed elsewhere brought agellius safely through it they then proceeded cautiously as before till they stood before the back door of the house of jucundus say a good word for me to your uncle said the boy i've done my job he must remember me handsomely at the augustalia and he ran away meanwhile cacilius had been anxiously considering the course which it was safest for him to pursue he must move but he must wait till dusk when the ways were clear and the light uncertain till then he must keep close indoors there was a remarkable cavern in the mountains above sicca which had been used as a place of refuge for christians from the very time they had first suffered persecution in roman africa no spot in its whole territory seemed more fit for what is called a base of operations from which the soldiers of the cross might advance or to which they might retire according as the fury of their enemy grew or diminished while it was in the midst of a wilderness difficult to access and feared as the resort of ghosts and evil influences it was not far from a city near to which the high roads met from hippo and from carthage a branch of the bagradas navigable for boats opened away from it through the woods where flight and concealment were easy on a surprise as far as madaura vaca and other places at the same time it commanded the vast plain on the south which extended to the roots of the atlas just now the persecution growing many deacons other ecclesiastics and prominent laymen from all parts of the country had fallen back upon this cavern or grotto and in no place could cacilius have better means than here of learning the general state of affairs and of communicating with countries beyond the seas he was indeed on his way thither when the illness of agellius made it a duty for him to stop and restore him and attend to his spiritual needs and he had received an inward intimation on which he implicitly relied to do so the problem at this moment was how to reach the refuge in question his direct road lay through sicca this being impracticable at present he had to descend into the ravine which lay between him and the city and turning to the left to traverse the broad plain the campus martius of sicca into which it opened here the mountain would rise abruptly on his right with those steep cliffs which we have already described as rounding the north side of sicca he must traverse many miles before he could reach the point at which the rock lost its precipitous character and changed into a declivity allowing the traveller to ascend it was a bold undertaking for all this he had to accomplish in the dark before the morning broke a stranger too to the locality and directing his movements only by the information of others which however accurate and distinct could scarcely be followed even without risk of error at least without misgiving however could he master this point before the morning he was comparatively safe 
he then had to strike into the solitary mountains and to retrace his steps for a while towards sicca along the road till he came to a place where he knew that christian scouts or videttes as they may be called were always stationed this being his plan and there being no way of mending it our confessor retired into the cottage and devoted the intervening hours to intercourse with that world from which his succour must come he set himself to intercede for the holy catholic church throughout the world now for the most part under persecution and for the roman empire not yet holy which was the instrument of the evil powers against her he had to pray for the proconsulate for numidia for mauritania and the whole of africa for the christian communities throughout it for the cessation of the trial then present and for the fortitude and perseverance of all who were tried he had to pray for his own personal friends his penitents converts enemies for children catechumens neophytes for those who were approaching the church for those who had fallen away or were falling away from her for all heretics for all troublers of unity that they might be reclaimed he had to confess bewail and deprecate the many sins and offences which he knew of foreboded or saw in prospect as to come scarcely had he entered on his charge at carthage four years before when he had had to denounce one portentous scandal in which a sacred order of the ministry was implicated what internal laxity did not that scandal imply and then again what a low standard of religion what niggardly faith and what worn-out used-up sanctity in the community at large was revealed in the fact of those frequent apostasies of individuals which then were occurring he prayed fervently that both from the bright pattern of martyrs and from the warning afforded by the lapsed the christian body might be edified and invigorated he saw with great anxiety two schisms in prospect when the persecution should come to an end one from the perverseness of those who were too rigid the other from those who were too indulgent towards the fallen and in proportion to his gift of prescience there was the earnestness of his intercession that the wounds of the church might be healed with the least possible delay he then turned to the thought of his own correspondence then in progress with the holy roman church which had lately lost its bishop by martyrdom this indeed was no unusual event with the see of peter in which the successors of peter followed peter's steps as peter had been bidden to follow the king and exemplar of martyrs but the special trouble was that months had passed full five since the vacancy occurred and it had not yet been supplied then he thought of fabian who made the vacancy and who had already passed through that trial which was to bring to so many christians life or condemnation and he commended himself to his prayers against the hour of his own combat he thought of fabian's work and went on to intercede for the remnant of the seven apostles whom that pope had sent into gaul and some of whom had already obtained the martyr's crown he prayed that the day might come when not the cities only of that fair country but its rich champagnes and sunny slopes should hear the voice of the missionary he prayed in like manner for britain that the successful work of another pope st eleutherius might be extended even to its four seas and then he prayed for the neighbouring island on the west still in heathen darkness and for the endless expanse of germany on the east that there too the one saving name and glorious faith might be known and accepted his thoughts then travelled back to rome and italy and to the martyrdoms which had followed that of st fabian two persians had already suffered in the imperial city maximus had lost his life and felix had been imprisoned at nola asia minor syria and egypt had already afforded victims to the persecution and cried aloud to all christians for their most earnest prayers and for repeated masses in behalf of those who remained under the trial babalus bishop of antioch the third see in christendom was already martyred in that city here again cacilius had a strong call on him for intercession for a subtle form of free-thinking was there manifesting itself the issue of which was as uncertain as it might be frightful 
the bishop of alexandria that second of the large divisions or patriarchates of the church the great dionysius the pupil of origen was an exile from his see like himself the messenger who brought this news to carthage had heard at alexandria a report from neo caesarea that gregory another pupil of origen's the apostle of pontus had also been obliged to conceal himself from the persecution as for origen himself the aged laborious gifted zealous teacher of his time he was just then engaged in answering the works of an epicurean called celsus and on him too the persecution was likely to fall and cacilius prayed earnestly that so great a soul might be kept from such high untrue speculations as were threatening evil at antioch and from every deceit and snare which might endanger his inheriting that bright crown which ought to be his portion in heaven another remarkable report had come viz that some young men of egypt had retired to the deserts up the country under the stress of the persecution paul was the name of one of them and that they were there living in the practice of mortification and prayer so singular and had combats with the powers of darkness and visitations from above so special as to open quite a new era in the spiritual history of the church and then his thoughts came back to his poor agellius and all those hundred private matters of anxiety which the foes of the church occupied only with her external aspect little suspected for agellius he prayed and for his for the strange wayward juba for eucundus for callista ah that callista might be brought on to that glorious consummation for which she seemed marked out but the ways of the most high are not as our ways and those who to us seem nearest are often furthest from him and so our holy priest left the whole matter in the hands of him to whom he prayed satisfied that he had done his part by praying this was the course of thought which occupied him for many hours after as we have said he had closed the door upon him and knelt down before the cross not merely before the symbol of redemption did he kneel for he opened his tunic at the neck and drew thence a small golden pyx which was there suspended in that carefully fastened case he possessed the holiest his lord and his god that everlasting presence was his stay and guide amid his weary wanderings his joy and consolation amid his overpowering anxieties behold the secret of his sweet serenity and his clear unclouded determination he had placed it upon the small table at which he knelt and was soon absorbed in meditation and intercession End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain a passage of arms how many hours passed while cacilius was thus employed he did not know the sun was declining when he was roused by a noise at the door he hastily restored the sacred treasure to its hiding-place in his breast and rose up from his knees the door was thrown back and a female form presented itself at the opening she looked in at the priest and said then agellius is not here the woman was young tall and graceful in person she was clad in a yellow cotton tunic reaching to her feet on which were shoes the clasps at her shoulders partly visible under the short cloak or shawl which was thrown over them and which might if necessary be drawn over her head seemed to serve the purpose not only of fastening her dress but of providing her with sharp prongs or minute stilettos for her defence in case she fell in with ruffians by the way and though the expression of her face was most feminine there was that about it which implied she could use them for that purpose on an emergency that face was clear in complexion regular in outline and at the present time pale whatever might be its ordinary tint its charm was a noble and majestic calm there is the calm of divine peace and joy there is the calm of heartlessness there is the calm of reckless desperation there is the calm of death 
none of these was the calm which breathed from the features of the stranger who intruded upon the solitude of cicillius it was the calm of greek sculpture it imaged a soul nourished upon the visions of genius and subdued and attuned by the power of a strong will there was no appearance of timidity in her manner very little of modesty the evening sun gleamed across her amber robe and lit it up till it glowed like fire as if she were invested in the marriage flammeum and was to be claimed that evening as the bride of her own bright god of day she looked at cicillius first with surprise then with anxiety and her words were you i fear are of his people if so make the most of these hours the foe may be on you to-morrow morning fly while you can if i am a christian answered cicillius what are you who are so careful of us have you come all the way from sicca to give the alarm to mere atheists and magic mongers stranger she said if you had seen what i have seen what i have heard of to-day you would not wonder at my wish to save from a like fate the vilest being on earth a hideous mob is rioting in the city thirsting for the blood of christians an accident may turn it in the direction of agellius he is gone where is he murderous outrages have already been perpetrated you remain she who is so tender of christians answered the priest must herself have some sparks of the christian flame in her own breast Callista sat down half unconsciously upon the bench or stool near the door but she at once suddenly started up again and said away fly perhaps they are coming where is he fear not said cicillius agellius has been conveyed away to a safe hiding-place for me i shall be taken care of there is no need for hurry sit down again but you he continued you must not be found here they know me she said i am well known here i work for the temples i have nothing to fear i am no christian and as if from an inexplicable overruling influence she sat down again not a christian yet you mean answered cicillius a person must be born a christian sir she replied in order to take up the religion it is a very beautiful idea as far as i have heard anything about it but one must suck it in with one's mother's milk if so it never could have come into the world said the priest she paused for a while it is true she answered at length but a new religion begins by appealing to what is peculiar in the minds of a few the doctrine floating on the winds finds its own it takes possession of their minds they answer its call they are brought together by that common influence they are strong in each other's sympathy they create and throw around them an external form and thus they found a religion the sons are brought up in their father's faith and what was the idea of a few becomes at length the profession of a race such is judaism such the religion of zoroaster or of the egyptians you will find said the priest that the greater number of african christians at this moment for of them i speak confidently are converts in manhood not the sons of christians on the other hand if there be those who have left the faith and gone up to the capital to sacrifice these were christians by hereditary profession such is my experience and i think the case is the same elsewhere she seemed to be speaking more for the sake of getting answers than of objecting arguments she paused again and thought and then she said mankind is made up of classes of very various mental complexion as distinct from each other as the colours which meet the eye red and blue are incommensurable and in like manner a magian never can become a greek nor a greek a colicolist they do but make themselves fools when they attempt it perhaps the most deeply convinced the most tranquil-minded in the christian body 
answered Cacilius. We'll tell you on the contrary, that there was a time when they hated Christianity and despised and ill-treated its professors. I never did any such thing, cried Callista. Since the day I first heard of it, I am not its enemy, but I cannot believe in it. I am sure I never could, I never, never should be able. What is it you cannot believe? asked the priest. It seems too beautiful, she said, to be anything else than a dream. It is a thing to talk about, but when you come near its professors you see it is impossible. A most beautiful imagination, that is what it is most beautiful its precepts as far as i have heard of them so beautiful that in idea there is no difficulty the mind runs along with them as if it could accomplish them without an effort well its maxims are too beautiful to be realized and then on the other hand its dogmas are too dismal too shocking too odious to be believed they revolt me such as what asked cacilius such as this answered callista nothing will ever make me believe that all my people have gone and will go to an eternal tartarus had we not better confine ourselves to something more specific more tangible asked cacilius gravely i suppose if one individual may have that terrible lot another may both may many may suppose i understand you to say that you never will believe that you will go to an eternal tartarus callista gave a slight start and showed some uneasiness or displeasure is it not likely continued he that you are better able to speak of yourself and to form a judgment about yourself than about others perhaps if you could first speak confidently about yourself you would be in a better position to speak about others also do you mean she said in a calm tone that my place after this life is an everlasting tartarus are you happy he asked in turn she paused looked down and in a deep clear voice said no there was a silence the priest began again perhaps you have been growing in unhappiness for years is it so you assent you have a heavy burden at your heart you don't well know what and the chance is that you will grow in unhappiness for the next ten years to come you will be more and more unhappy the longer you live did you live till you were an old woman you would not know how to bear your existence callista cried out as if in bodily pain oh, it is true sir whoever told you but how can you have the heart to say it to insult and mock me god forbid exclaimed cacilius but let me go on listen my child be brave and dare to look at things as they are every day adds to your burden this is a law of your present being somewhat more certain than the assertion which you just now so confidently made the impossibility of your believing in that law you cannot refuse to accept what is not an opinion but a fact i say this burden which i speak of is not simply a dogma of our creed it is an undeniable fact of nature you cannot change it by wishing if you were to live on earth two hundred years it would not be reversed it would be more and more true at the end of two hundred years you would be too miserable even for your worst enemy to rejoice in it cacilius spoke as if half in soliloquy or meditation though he was looking towards callista the contrast between them was singular he thus abstracted she too utterly forgetful of self but absorbed in him and showing it by her eager eyes her hushed breath her anxious attitude at last she said impatiently father you are speaking to yourself you despise me the priest looked straight at her with an open untroubled smile and said callista do not doubt me my poor child 
you are in my heart i was praying for you shortly before you appeared no but in so serious a matter as attempting to save a soul i like to speak to you in my lord's sight i am speaking to you indeed i am my child but i am also pleading with you on his behalf and before his throne his voice trembled as he spoke but he soon recovered himself suffer me he said i was saying that if you lived five hundred years on earth you would but have a heavier load on you as time went on but you will not live you will die perhaps you will tell me that you will then cease to be i don't believe you think so i may take for granted that you think with me and with the multitude of men that you will still live and that you will still be you you will still be the same being but deprived of those outward stays and reliefs and solaces which such as they are you now enjoy you will be yourself shut up in yourself i have heard that people go mad at length when placed in solitary confinement if then on passing hence you are cut off from what you had here and have only the company of yourself i think your burden will be so far greater not less than it is now suppose for instance you had still your love of conversing and could not converse your love of the poets of your race and no means of recalling them your love of music and no instrument to play upon your love of knowledge and nothing to learn your desire of sympathy and no one to love would not that be still greater misery let me proceed a step further supposing you were among those whom you actually did not love supposing you did not like them nor their occupations and could not understand their aims suppose there be as christians say one almighty god and you did not like him and had no taste for thinking of him and no interest in what he was and what he did and supposing you found that there was nothing else anywhere but he whom you did not love and whom you wished away would you not be still more wretched and if this went on for ever would you not be in great inexpressible pain for ever assuming then first that the soul always needs external objects to rest upon next that it has no prospect of any such when it leaves this visible scene and thirdly that the hunger and thirst the gnawing of the heart where it occurs is as keen and piercing as a flame it will follow there is nothing irrational in the notion of an eternal tartarus i cannot answer you sir said callista but i do not believe the dogma on that account a whit the more my mind revolts from the notion there must be some way out of it if on the other hand continued cacilius not noticing her interruption if all your thoughts go one way if you have needs desires aims aspirations all of which demand an object and imply by their very existence that such an object does exist also and if nothing here does satisfy them and if there be a message which professes to come from that object of whom you already have the presentiment and to teach you about him and to bring the remedy you crave and if those who try that remedy say with one voice that the remedy answers are you not bound callista at least to look that way to inquire into what you hear about it and to ask for his help if he be to enable you to believe in him this is what a slave of mine used to say cried callista abruptly and another agellius hinted the same thing what is your remedy what your object what your love o christian teacher 
why are you all so mysterious so reserved in your communications cacilius was silent for a moment and seemed at a loss for an answer at length he said every man is in that state which you confess of yourself we have no love for him who alone lasts we love those things which do not last but come to an end things being thus he whom we ought to love has determined to win us back to him with this object he has come into his own world in the form of one of us men and in that human form he opens his arms and woos us to return to him our maker this is our worship this is our love callista you talk as chione callista answered only that she felt and you teach she could not speak of her master without blushing for joy and agellius when he said one word about his master he too began to blush it was plain that the priest could hardly command his feelings and they sat for a short while in silence then callista began as if musing on what she had heard a loved one she said yet ideal a passion so potent so fresh so innocent so absorbing so expulsive of other loves so enduring yet of one never beheld mysterious it is our own notion of the first and only fair yet embodied in a substance yet dissolving again into a sort of imagination it is beyond me there is but one lover of souls cried cacilius and he loves each one of us as though there were no one else to love he died for each one of us as if there were no one else to die for he died on the shameful cross amor meus crucifixus est the love which he inspires lasts for it is the love of the unchangeable it satisfies for he is inexhaustible the nearer we draw to him the more triumphantly does he enter into us the longer he dwells in us the more intimately we have possession of him it is an espousal for eternity this is why it is so easy for us to die for our faith at which the world marvels presently he said why will not you approach him why will not you leave the creature for the creator callista seldom lost her self-possession for a moment she lost it now tears gushed from her eyes impossible she said what i you do not know me father she paused and then resumed in a different tone no my lot is one way yours another i am a child of greece and have no happiness but that such as it is which my own bright land my own glorious race give me i may well be content i may well be resigned i may well be proud if i possess that happiness i must live and die where i have been born i am a tree which will not bear transplanting the assyrians the jews the egyptians have their own mystical teaching they follow their happiness in their own way mine is a different one the pride of mind the revel of the intellect the voice and eyes of genius and the fond beating heart i cannot do without them i cannot do without what you christian call sin let me alone such as nature made me i will be i cannot change this sudden revulsion of her feelings quite overcame cacilius yet while the disappointment thrilled through him he felt a most strange sympathy for the poor lost girl and his reply was full of emotion am i a jew he exclaimed am i an egyptian or an assyrian have i from my youth believed and possessed what now is my life my hope and my love child what was once my life 
am not i too a brand plucked out of the fire do i deserve anything but evil is it not the power the mighty power of the only strong the only merciful the grace of emmanuel which has changed and won me if he can change me an old man could he not change a child like you i a proud stern roman i a lover of pleasure a man of letters of political station with formed habits and lifelong associations and complicated relations was it i who wrought this great change in me who gained for myself the power of hating what i once loved of unlearning what i once knew nay of even forgetting what once i was who has made you and me to differ but he who can when he will make us to agree it is his same omnipotence which will transform you if you will but come to be transformed but a reaction had come over the proud and sensitive mind of the greek girl so after all priest she said you are but a man like others a frail guilty person like myself i can find plenty of persons who do as i do i want someone who does not i want someone to worship i thought there was something in you special and extraordinary there was a gentleness and tenderness mingled with your strength which was new to me i said here at last a god my own gods are earthly sensual i have no respect for them no faith in them but there is nothing better anywhere else alas she started up and said with vehemence i thought you sinless you confess to crime oh, how do i know she continued with a shudder that you are better than those base hypocrites priests of isis or mithras whose lustrations initiations new birth white robes and laurel crowns are but the instrument and cloak of their intense depravity and she felt for the clasp upon her shoulder here her speech was interrupted by a hoarse sound borne upon the wind as of many voices blended into one and softened by the distance but which under the circumstance neither of the parties to the above conversation had any difficulty in assigning to its real cause dear father she said the enemy is upon you End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain he shall not lose his reward there was no room for doubt or for delay what is to become of you callista he said they will tear you to pieces fear nothing for me father she answered i am one of them they know me alas i am no christian i have not abjured their rights but you lose not a moment they are still at some distance he said though the wind gives us merciful warning of their coming he looked about the room and took up the books of holy scripture which were on the shelf there is nothing else he said of special value here agellius could not take them here my child i am going to show you a great confidence to few persons not christians would i show it take this blessed parchment it contains the earthly history of our divine master here you will see whom we christians love read it keep it safely surrender it when you have the opportunity into christian keeping my mind tells me i am not wrong in lending it to you he handed to her the gospel of st luke while he put the two other volumes into the folds of his own tunic one word more she said your name should i want you he took up a piece of chalk from the shelf and wrote upon the wall in distinct characters thasius caecilius cyprianus bishop of carthage hardly had she read the inscription when the voices of several men were heard in the very neighbourhood of the cottage and hoping to effect a diversion in favour of cacilius 
and being at once unsuspicious of danger to herself and careless of her life she ran quickly forward to meet them cecilius ought to have taken to flight without a moment's delay but a last sacred duty detained him he knelt down and took the pyx from his bosom he had eaten nothing that day but even if otherwise it was a crisis which allowed him to consume the sacred species without fasting he hastily opened the golden case adored the blessed sacrament and consumed it purifying its receptacle and restoring it to its hiding-place then he rose at once and left the cottage he looked about callista was nowhere to be seen she was gone so much was certain no enemy was in sight it only remained for him to make off too in the confusion he turned in the wrong direction instead of making off at the back of the cottage from which the voices had scared him he ran across the garden into the hollow way it was all over with him in an instant he fell at once into the hands of the vanguard of the mob many mouths were opened upon him all at once the sorcerer cried one tear him to shreds we'll teach him to brew his spells against the city give us back our grapes and corn said a second have a guard said a third he can turn you into swine or asses while there is breath in him then be the quicker with him said a fourth who was lifting up a crowbar to discharge upon his head hold said a tall swarthy youth who had already warded off several blows from him hold will you don't you see if you kill him he can't undo the spell make him first reverse it all make him take the curse off us bring him along take him to astarte hercules or old saturn we'll broil him on a gridiron till he turns all these canes into vines and makes olive berries of the pebbles and turns the dust of the earth into fine flour for our eating when he has done all this he shall dance a jig with a wild cow and sit down to supper with a hyena a loud scream of exultation broke forth from the drunken and frantic multitude along with him continued the same speaker in a jeering tone here put him on the ass and tie his hands behind his back he shall go back in triumph to the city which he loves mind and don't touch him before the time if you kill him you'll never get the curse off come here you priests of sibylle he added and be his bodyguard and he continued to keep a vigilant eye and hand over the old man in spite of them the ass though naturally a good-tempered beast had been most sadly tried through the day he had been fed indeed out of mockery as being the christian's god but he did not understand the shouts and caprices of the crowd and he only waited for an opportunity to show that he by no means acquiesced in the proceedings of the day and now the difficulty was to move at all the people kept crowding up the hollow road and blocked the passage and though the greater part of the rioters had either been left behind exhausted in sicca itself or had poured over the fields on each side of agellius's cottage or gone right over the hill down into the valley beyond yet still it was some time before the ass could move a step and a time of nervous suspense it was both to cecilius and the youth who befriended him at length what remained of the procession was persuaded to turn about and make for sicca but in a reversed order it could not be brought round in so confined a space so its rear went first and the ass and its burden came last as they descended the hill back again cecilius who was mounted upon the linen and silk which had adorned the dais syra before the tertullianist had destroyed the idol saw before him the whole line of march in front were flaunted the dreadful emblems of idolatry so far as the bearers were able still to raise them drunken women ragged boys mounted on men's shoulders ruffians and bullies savage-looking gatulians half-human monsters from the atlas monkeys and curs jabbering and howling mummers bacchanals satyrs and gesticulators formed the staple of the procession midway between the hill which he was descending and the city lay the ravine of which we have several times spoken widening out into the plain or compass martius which reached around to the steep cliffs on the north the bridle path along which he was moving crossed it just where it was opening and became level so as to present no abrupt descent and ascent at the place where the path was lowest on the left every vestige of the ravine soon ceased and a free passage extended to the plain 
the youth who had placed cecilius on the ass still kept close to him and sung at the pitch of his voice in imitation of the rest sporting and snorting in shades of the night his ears pricking up and his hoof striking light and his tail whisking round in the speed of his flight old man he continued to cecilius in a low voice and in latin your curse has not worked on me yet my son answered the priest you are granted one day more for repentance lucky for you as well as for me was the reply and he continued his song goethe the witch was out with the rest though as lame as a gull by his highness possessed she shouldered her crutch and danced with the best she stamped and she twirled in the shade of the yew till her gossips and chums of the city danced too they never are slack when there's mischief to do she danced and she coaxed but he was no fool he'd be his own master he'd not be her tool not the little black moor should send him to school he then turned to cecilius and whispered you see old father that others besides christians can forgive and forget henceforth call me generous juba and he tossed his head by this time they had got to the bottom of the hill and the deep shadows which filled the hollow showed that the sun was rapidly sinking in the west suddenly as they were crossing the bottom as it opened into the plain juba seized and broke the thong which bound cecilius's arms and bestowing a tremendous cut with it upon the side of the ass sent him forward upon the plain at his greatest speed the youth's manoeuvre was successful to the full the asses of africa can do more on an occasion of this kind than our own cecilius for the moment lost his seat but instantly recovering it took care to keep the animal from flagging and the cries of the mob and the howlings of the priests of sibylle cooperated in the task at length the gloom increasing every minute hid him from their view and even in daylight his recapture would have been a difficult matter for a wearied out famished and intoxicated rabble before cecilius well had time to return thanks for this unexpected turn of events he was out of pursuit and was ambling at a pace more suitable to the habits of the beast of burden that carried him over an expanse of plain which would have been a formidable night march to a fasting man we must not conclude the day without relating what was its issue to the persecutors as well as to their intended victim it is almost a proverb that punishment is slow in overtaking crime but the present instance was an exception to the rule while the exiled bishop of carthage escaped the crowd on the other hand were caught in the trap which had been laid for them we have already said it was a ruse on the part of the governing authorities of the place to get the rioters out of the city that they might at once be relieved of them and then deal with them just as they might think fit when the mob was once outside the walls they might be refused readmittance and put down with a strong hand the roman garrison who powerless to quell the tumult in the narrow and winding streets and multiplied alleys of the city had been the authors of the manoeuvre now took on themselves the stern completion of it and determined to do so in the sternest way not a single head of all those who poured out in the afternoon should return at night it was not to be supposed that the soldiers had any tenderness for the christians but they abominated and despised the rabble of the town they were indignant at their rising thought it a personal insult to themselves and resolved they should never do so again the gates were commonly in the custody of the city guard but the porta septimiana by which the mob passed out was on this occasion claimed by the romans it was most suitably circumstanced for the use they intended to make of it immediately outside of it was a large court of the same level as the ground inside bordered on the right and left by substantial walls which after a time were drawn to meet each other and contracted the space to the usual breadth of a road the walls continued to run along this road for some distance till they joined the way which led to the compass marshes from this point the ground was open till it reached the head of the ravine the soldiers drew up at the gate and as the worn out and disappointed brutalized and half idiotic multitudes returned towards it from the country those who were behind pushed on between the border walls those who were in front and while they jammed together their ranks also made escape impossible it was now that the roman soldiers began their barbarous not to say cowardly 
assault upon them with heavy maces with the pike with iron gauntlets with stones and bricks with clubs with scourge with the sword with the helmet with whatever came to hand they commenced the massacre of that large concourse of human beings who did not offer one blow in return they slaughtered them like sheep they trampled them down they threw the bodies of the wounded over the walls attempting to run back numbers of the poor wretches came into conflict with the ranks behind them and an additional scene of confusion and overthrow took place many of them straggled over to the open country or woods and perished either from the weather or from hunger or even from the wild beasts others weakened by excess and famine fell a prey to the pestilence that was raging after some days a remnant of them was allowed silently and timidly to steal back into the city as best they could it was a long day before the plebes sicensis ventured to have any opinion of its own upon the subject of christianity or any other political social or ecclesiastical topic whatever End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain startling rumors when jucundus rose next morning and heard the news he considered it to be more satisfactory than he could have supposed possible he was a zealous imperialist and a lover of tranquillity a despiser of the natives and a hater of the christians the christians had suffered enough to vindicate the roman name to deter those who were playing at christianity and to show that the people of sicca had their eyes about them and the mob had received a severe lesson too and the cause of public order had triumphed and civic peace was re-established his anxiety too about agellius had terminated or was terminating he had privately denounced him to the government come to an understanding with the military authorities and obtained the custody of him he had met him at the very door to which the boy fermion brought him with an apparitor of the military staff or what answered to it and had clapped him into prison in an underground cellar in which he kept damaged images and those which had gone out of fashion and were otherwise unsaleable he was not at all sorry by some suffering and by some fright to aid the more potent incantation which callista was singing in his ears he did not however at all forget juba's hint and was careful not to overdo the rack and gridiron dodge if we may so designate it yet he thought just a flavour or a thought of the inconveniences which the profession of christianity involved might be a salutary reflection in the midst of the persuasives which the voice and eyes of callista would kindle in his heart there was nothing glorious or heroic in being confined in a lumber cellar no one knowing anything about it and he did not mean to keep him there for ever as the next day wore on towards evening rumour brought a piece of news which he was at first utterly unable to credit and which for the moment seemed likely to spoil the appetite which promised so well for his evening repast he could hardly believe his ears when he was told that callista was in arrest on a charge of christianity and at first it made him look as black as some of those egyptian gods which he had on one shelf of his shop however he rallied and was very much amused at the report the imprisonment indeed was a fact account for it as one could but who could account for it varium et mutabile who could answer for the whims and fancies of womankind if she had fallen in love with the owl of minerva or cut off her auburn tresses or turned rope dancer there might have been some shrugging of shoulders but no one would have tried to analyze the motive but so much his profound sagacity enabled him to see that if there was one thing more than another likely to sicken agellius of christianity it was to find one who was so precious to him suffering from the suspicion of it it was bad enough to have suffered oneself in such a cause 
still he could conceive he was large-minded enough to grant that agellius might have some secret satisfaction in the antagonist feeling of resentment and obstinacy which that suffering might engender but it was carrying matters too far and no comfort in any point of view to find callista his beloved the object of a similar punishment it was all very well to profess christianity as a matter of sentiment mystery and singularity but when it was found to compromise the life or limbs of another and that other callista why it was plain that agellius would be the very first to try and entreat the wayward girl to keep her good looks for him and to be loyal to the gods of her country and he chuckled over the thought as others have done in other states of society of a love scene or a marriage being the termination of so much high romance and fine acting however the next day aristo came down to him himself and gave him an account at once more authentic and more extended on the matter which interested him callista had been called up before the tribunal and had not been discharged but remanded the meaning of it was as obscure as ever aristo could give no account of it it almost led him to believe in the evil eye some unholy practices some spells such as only potent wizards know some deplorable delusion or hallucination had for the time got the mastery of his sister's mind no one seemed quite to know how she had found her way into the hands of the officers but there she was and the problem was how to get her out of them however whatever mystery whatever anxiety attached to the case it was only still more urgent to bring the matter home to agellius without delay if time went on before the parties were brought together she might grow more obstinate and kindle a like spirit in him oh that boys and girls would be giving old people who wished them well so much trouble however it was no good thinking of that just then he considered that at the present moment they would not be able to bear the sight of each other in suffering and peril that mutual tenderness would make them plead with each other in each other's behalf and that each would be obliged to set the example to each of a concession to which each exhorted each and on this fine philosophical view he proceeded to act End of chapter twenty one Chapter Twenty Two of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Jucundus propounds his view of the situation. For thirty six hours, Agellius had been confined in his underground receptacle, light being almost excluded, a bench and a rug being his means of repose, and a full measure of bread, wine, and olives being his dole the shrieks and yells of the rioters could be distinctly heard in his prison as the day of his seizure went on and they passed by the temple of astarte but what happened at his farm and how it fared with cecilius he had no means of conjecturing nor indeed how it was to fare with himself for on the face of the transaction as was in form the fact he was in the hands of the law and only indulged with the house of a relative for his prison on the second night he was released by his uncle's confidential slave who brought him up to a small back closet on the ground floor which was lighted from the roof and next morning being the second day after the riot jucundus came in to have his confidential conversation with him his uncle began by telling him that he was a government prisoner but that he hoped by his influence in high places to get him off and out of sicca without any prejudice to his honour he told him that he had managed it privately and if he had treated him with apparent harshness up to the evening before it was in order to save appearances with the apparitors who had attended him he then went on to inform him that the mob had visited his cottage and had caught some man there he supposed some accomplice or ally of his nephew's they had seized him and were bringing him off but the fellow had been clever enough to effect his escape he did not know more than this but it had happened very fortunately for the general belief in the place was that it was agellius who had been taken and who had managed to give them the slip since it could not any longer be safely denied that he was a christian 
though he jucundus did not think so himself he had encouraged or rather had given his confirmation to the report and when some persons who had means of knowing had asserted that the culprit was double the age of his nephew and more and not at all of his make or description but a sort of slave or rather that he was the slave of agellius who had belonged to his father strabo jucundus had boldly asserted that agellius in the emergency had availed himself of some of the remarkably powerful charms which christians were known to possess and had made himself seem what he really was not in order to escape detection it had not indeed answered the purpose entirely for he had actually been taken but no blame in the charm which perhaps after all had enabled him to escape however agellius was gone he told people and a good riddance and he hoped never to see him again but you see my dear boy he concluded this was all talk for the occasion for i hope you will live here many years in respectability and credit i intend you should close my eyes when my time comes and inherit whatever i have to leave you for as to that fellow juba he inspires me with no confidence in him at all agellius thanked his uncle with all his heart for his kind and successful efforts on his behalf he did not think there was a word he had said in the future he had sketched for him which he could have wished altered but he thought jucundus over sanguine much as he should like to live with him and tend him in his old age he did not think he should ever be permitted to return to sicca he was a christian and must seek some remote corner of the world or at least some city where he was unknown every one in sicca would point at him as the christian he would experience a thousand rubs and collisions even if the mob did not rise against him without corresponding advantage on the other hand he would have no influence but were he in the midst of a powerful and widely extended community of christians he might in his place do work and might extend the faith as one of a number unknown himself and strong in his brethren he therefore proposed as soon as possible to sell his effects and stock and retire from the sight of men at least for a time uh, you think this persecution then will be soon at an end asked jucundus i judge by the past answered agellius there have been times of trial and of rest hitherto and i suppose it will be so again and one place has hitherto been exempt from the violence of our enemies when another has been the scene of it a new time is coming trust me said jucundus gravely those popular commotions are all over what happened two days ago is a sample of what will come of them they have received their coup de grace the state is taking up the matter rome itself thank the gods a tougher sort of customer than these villain rat-catchers and awful eaters whom you had to do with two days since great rome is now at length in earnest my boy which she ought to have been a long time back before you were born and then you know he nodded you would have had no choice you wouldn't have had the temptation to make a fool of yourself well then answered agellius if a new time is really coming there is less chance than ever of my continuing here now be a sensible fellow as you are when you choose said his uncle look the matter in the face do you cannot wrestle with impossibilities you cannot make facts to pattern there are lawful religions there are illicit christianity is illicit it is not tolerated that's not your fault you cannot help it you would if you could you can't now you have observed your point of honour you have shown you can stand up like a man and suffer for your own fancy still rome does not give way and you must make the best of it you must give in and you are far too good i don't compliment i speak my mind far too amiable excellent sweet a boy for so rascally a superstition there is something stronger than rome said the nephew almost sternly jucundus cut him short agellius he said 
you must not say that in this house you shall not use that language under my roof i'll not put up with it i tell you take your treason elsewhere this accursed obstinacy he said to himself but i must take care what i am doing then aloud well we both of us have been railing no good comes of railing railing is not argument but now i say do be sensible if you can is not the imperial government in earnest now better late than never but it is now in earnest and now mark my words by this day five years five years at the utmost i say by this day five years there will not be a single ragamuffin christian in the whole roman world and he looked fierce ye gods rome rome has swept from the earth by her very breath conspiracies confederacies plots against her without ever failing she will do so now with this contemptible jew begotten foe in what are we enemies to rome jucundus said agellius why will you always take it for granted take it for granted answered he is it not on the face of the matter i suppose they are enemies to a state whom the state calls its enemies besides why a pother of words swear by the genius of the emperor invoke the dea roma sacrifice to jove no not a bit of it not a whisper not a sign not a grain of incense you go out of your way to insult us and then you come with a grave face and say you are loyal you kick our shins and you wish us to kiss you on both cheeks for it a few harmless ceremonies we are not entrapping you we are not using your words against yourselves we tell you the meaning beforehand the whole meaning of them it is not as if we tied you to the belief of the nursery we don't say if you burn incense you profess to believe that old jupiter is shivering atop of olympus we, we don't say you swear by the genius of caesar therefore he has a genius black or white or piebald <laughs> no we give you the meaning of the act it is a mere expression of loyalty to the empire if then you won't do it you confess yourself ipso facto disloyal it is incomprehensible and he had become quite red my dear uncle said agellius i give you my solemn word that the people whom you so detest do pray for the welfare of the imperial power continually as a matter of duty and as a matter of interest pray pray fudge and nonsense cried jucundus almost mimicking him in his indignation pray pray who thanks you for your prayers what's the good of prayers prayers indeed ha ha a little loyalty is worth all the praying in the world i'll tell you what agellius you are i'm sorry to say it but you are hand and glove with a set of traitors who shall and will be smoked out like a nest of wasps you don't know you are not in the secret nor the wretched slave poor beast who was pulled to pieces yesterday ah uh, you don't know of him at the flamens uh, nor a multitude of other idiots but do you see and he checked up his head significantly there are puppets and there are wires few know what is going on they won't have done unless we put them down but we will till they have toppled down the state but rome will put them down come be sensible listen to reason now i am going to put facts before my poor dear well-meaning boy oh that you saw things as i do what a trouble you are to me here am i my dearest uncle jucundus cried agellius i assure you it is the most intense pain to me very well very well interrupted the uncle in turn i believe it of course i believe it but listen listen every now and then he continued in a more measured and lower tone every now and then the secret is blabbed blabbed 
there was that tertullianus of carthage some fifty years since he wrote books books have done a great deal of harm before now but read his books read and ponder the fellow has the insolence to tell the proconsul that he and the whole government the whole city and province the whole roman world the emperors all but the pitiful clique to which he belongs are destined after death to flames for ever and ever there's loyalty but the absurdity is greater than the malevolence rightly are the fellows called atheists and men haters our soldiers our statesmen our magistrates and judges and senators and the whole community all worshippers of the gods every one who crowns his head every one who loves a joke and all our great historic names heroes and worthies the scipios the decii brutus caesar cato titus trajan antoninus are inmates not of the elysian fields if elysian fields there be but of tartarus and will never find a way out of it that man tertullianus is nothing to us uncle answered agellius a man of great ability but he quarrelled with us and left us i can't draw nice distinctions said jucundus your people have quarrelled among themselves perhaps on an understanding we can't split hairs it's the same with your present hierophant at carthage cyprianus nothing can exaggerate i am told the foulness of his attack upon the gods of rome upon romulus the augurs the ancilia the consuls and whatever a roman is proud of as to the imperial city itself there is hardly one of their high priests that has not died under the hands of the executioner as a convict the precious fellows take the title of pontifex maximus bless their impudence well my boy this is what i say be if you will so preternaturally sour and morose as to misconceive and mislike the innocent graceful humanizing time-honoured usages of society be so for what i care if this is all but it isn't all such misanthropy is wisdom absolute wisdom compared with the titanic presumption and audacity of challenging to single combat the sovereign of the world go and kick down mount atlas first <laughs> you have it all your own way jucundus answered his nephew and so you must move in your own circle round and round there's no touching you if you first assume your premises and then prove them by means of your conclusion my dear agellius said his uncle giving his head a very solemn shake take the advice of an old man when you are older than you are you will see better who is right and who is wrong you'll be sorry you despised me a true a prudent an experienced friend you will shake yourself come do why should you link your fortunes in the morning of life with desperate men only because your father in his last feeble days was entrapped into doing so i really will not believe that you are going to throw away hope and life on so bad a bargain can't you speak a word here you've let me speak and won't say one syllable for yourself i don't think it kind of you thus adjured agellius began well he said it's a long history you see we start my dear uncle from different points how am i possibly to join issue with you i can only tell you my conclusion hope and life you say well my only hope my only life my only joy desire consolation and treasure is that i am a christian hope and life interrupted jucundus immortal gods life and hope in being a christian do i hear aright why man a prison brings despair not hope and the sword brings death not life by esculapius life and hope you choke me agellius life and hope you are beyond three antichiras life and hope if you were old if you were diseased if you were given over and had but one puff of life left in you then you might be what you would for me 
but your hair is black your cheek is round your limbs are strong your voice is full and you are going to make all these a sacrifice to hecate has your good genius fed that plump frame ripened those good looks nerved your arm bestowed that breadth of chest that strength of loins that straightness of spine that vigour of step only that you may feed the crows or to be torn on the rack scorched in the flame or hung on the gibbet is this your gratitude to nature what has been your price for what have you sold yourself speak man speak are you dumb as well as dement are you dumb i say are you dumb o oh, jucundus cried agellius irritated at his own inability to express himself or hold an argument if you did but know what it was to have the truth the christian has found the truth the eternal truth in a world of error that is his bargain that is his hire can there be a greater can i give up the truth but all this is punic or barber to you it certainly did pose jucundus for half a minute as if he was trying to take in not so much the sense as the words of his nephew's speech he looked bewildered and though he began to answer him at once it took several sentences to bring him into his usual flow of language after one or two exclamations the truth he cried this is what i understand you to say the the truth the truth is your bargain i think i'm right the truth hm what is truth what in heaven and earth do you mean by truth where did you get that cant what oriental tomfoolery is bamboozling you the truth he cried staring at him with eyes half of triumph half of impatience the truth jove help the boy the truth can truth pour me out a cup of melilotus can truth crown me with flowers can it sing to me can it bring glyceris to me drop gold into my girdle or cool my brows when fever visits me can truth give me a handsome suburban with some five hundred slaves or raise me to the duumvirate let it do this and i will worship it it shall be my god it shall be more to me than fortune fate rome or any other goddess on the list but i like to see and touch and feel and handle and weigh and measure what is promised me i wish to have a sample and an instalment i am too old for chaff eat drink and be merry that's my philosophy that's my religion and i know no better to-day is ours to-morrow is our children's after a pause he added bitterly if truth could get callista out of prison instead of getting her into it i should have something to say to truth callista in prison cried agellius with surprise and distress what do you mean jucundus yes it's a fact callista is in prison answered he and on suspicion of christianity callista callista christianity said agellius bewildered do i hear aright she a christian oh impossible uncle you don't mean to say that she is in prison tell me tell me my dear dear jucundus what this wonderful news means you ought to know more about it than i answered he if there is any meaning in it but if you want my opinion here it is i don't believe she is more a christian than i am but i think she is over head and ears in love with you and she has some notion that she is paying you a compliment or interesting you in her or sharing your fate i can't pretend to unravel the vagaries and tantrums of the female mind by saying that she is what she is not if not perhaps she has done it out of spite and contradiction you can never answer for a woman whom should she spite whom contradict cried agellius thrown for the moment off his balance oh callista callista in prison for christianity oh if it's true that she is a christian but what if she is not he added with great terror what if she's not and yet in prison as if she were how are we to get her out uncle impossible no she's not a christian she is not at all she ought not to be there yet how wonderful well i'm sure of it too said jucundus i'd stake the best image in my shop that she's not a christian 
but what if she is perverse enough to say she is and such things are not uncommon then i say what in the world is to be done if she says she is why she is there you are and what can you do you don't mean to say exclaimed agellius that that sweet delicate child is in that horrible hole impossible and he nearly shrieked at the thought what is the meaning of it all dear dear uncle do tell me something more about it why did you not tell me before what can be done jucundus thought he now had him in his hand why it's plain he answered what can be done she's no christian we both agree it's certain too that she chooses to say she is or something like it there's just one person who has influence with her to make her tell the truth ha ah, cried agellius starting as if an asp had bitten him jucundus kept silence and let the poison of the said asp work a while in his nephew's blood agellius put his hands before his eyes and with his elbows on his knees began moving to and fro as if in intense pain i repeat what i have said jucundus observed at length i do really think that she imagines a certain young gentleman is likely to be in trouble and that she is determined to share the trouble with him but it isn't true cried agellius with great vehemence it's not true if she really is not a christian oh my dear lord surely they won't put her to death as if she was but if she has made up her mind to be in the same boat with you and will be a christian while you are a christian what on earth can we do agellius asked jucundus you have the whole matter in a nutshell she does not love me cried agellius no she has given me no reason to think so i am sure she does not she's nothing to me that cannot be the reason of her conduct i have no power over her i could not persuade her what what does all this mean and i shut up here and he began walking about the little room as if such locomotion tended to bring him out of it well answered jucundus it is easy to ascertain i suppose you could be let out to see her but he was going on too fast agellius did not attend to him poor sweet callista he exclaimed she's innocent she's innocent i mean she's not a christian ah he screamed out in great agony as the whole state of the case unrolled itself to his apprehension she will die though not a christian she will die without faith without love she will die in her sins she will die done to death by false report of accepting that by which alone she could be carried safely through death unto life oh my lord spare me and he sank upon the ground in a collapse of misery jucundus was touched and still more alarmed come come my boy he said you will rouse the whole neighbourhood give over be a man all will be right if she's not a christian and she's not she shall not die a christian's death something will turn up she's not in any hole at all but in a decent lodging and you shall see her and console her and all will be right yes i will see her said agellius in a sort of musing manner she is either a christian or she is not if she is a christian and his voice faltered but if she is not she shall live till she is well said answered jucundus till she is she shall live till she is yes i can get you to see her you shall bring her out of prison a smile a whisper from you and all her fretfulness and ill-humour will vanish like a mist before the powerful burning sun and we shall all be as happy as the immortal gods oh my uncle said agellius gravely the language of jucundus had shocked him and brought him to a better mind he turned away from jucundus and leaned his face against the wall then he turned round again and said if she is a christian i ought to rejoice and i do rejoice god be praised if she is not a christian i ought at once to make her one if she has already the penalty of a christian she is surely destined for the privilege and how should i go he said half speaking to himself how should i go to tell her that she is not yet a christian and bid her swear by jupiter 
because that is her god in order that she may escape imprisonment and death am i to do the part of a heathen priest or infidel sophist o oh, cacilius how am i forgetting your lessons no i will go on no such errand go i will if i may jucundus but i will go on no conditions of yours i go on no promise to try to get her out of prison anyhow poor child i will not go to make her sacrifice to a false god i go to persuade her to stay in prison by deserving to stay perhaps i am not the best person to go but if i go i go free i go willing to die myself for my lord glad to make her die for him agellius said this in so determined a way so calmly with such a grasp of the existing posture of affairs and of the whole circumstances of the case that it was now jucundus's turn to feel surprise and annoyance for a time he did not take in what agellius meant nor could he to the last follow his train of feeling when he saw what may be called the upshot of the matter he became very angry and spoke with great violence by degrees he calmed and then the strong feeling came on him again that it was impossible if a meeting took place between the two that it could end in any way but one he defied any two young people who loved each other to come to any but one conclusion agellius's mood was too excited too tragic to last the sight of callista in that dreadful prison perhaps in chains waiting in order to be free for ability to say the words i am not a christian and that ability waiting for the same words from himself would bring the affair to a very speedy issue as if he could love a fancy better than he loved callista agellius too had already expressed a misgiving himself on that head so far they were agreed and to tell the truth it was a very difficult transaction for a young man and giving our poor agellius all credit for pure intention and firm resolve we really should have been very sorry to see him involved in a trial which would have demanded of him a most heroic faith and the detachment of a saint we therefore are not sorry that in matter of fact he gained the merit of so virtuous a determination without being called on to execute it for it so happened that a most unexpected event occurred to him not many hours afterwards which will oblige us to take up here rather abruptly the history of one of our other personages End of chapter twenty two